And the title for this morning is Follow the Lamb. Why don't we pray and ask God's presence and blessing on the study of His Word this morning. Heavenly Father, we pray that by Your Holy Spirit You would give us understanding that we might comprehend the riches and the blessings we have in Christ. That we might understand Your sovereignty and the salvation You have given us through faith in Your Son. And Lord, may You fill us and equip us with great hope in the midst of great difficulties, Lord. May we know Your good and perfect plan and trust You in it. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I must say, I feel like the last few weeks have been rather significant in our study of God's Word. I always have the sense that God is doing great things in His church. Uh, but even more specifically, recently, it seems that God has been doing uh, above and beyond maybe what I and we have expected through His Word. And yet, as we reflect on the last three weeks or so, there is a unifying theme in the book of Revelation. There's the dragon or Satan's hatred of Jesus and His church. That doesn't change. He always has hated the Lord. He will continue to and all those who follow Him. And we saw that in this section of Revelation, the dragon, the vision that John sees, is seeking to devour the Christ child Jesus, and he fails. And I like to think that Satan is a big failure. Because he is. He may have moments of success, but in the end and in the long run, he is an utter failure. Because Jesus and his people conquer him once and for all. You see... He's so full of hatred that he calls forth this beast out of the sea, this coalition of nations and the Antichrist himself to attack and make war on God's people. And for a time, he's allowed to do so. But God allows the church to overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And he even calls forth the second beast, which we'll finish off this morning. And that beast serves the first beast. He's the false prophet who causes the world population to worship and follow the beast. Now, in the world scene <clears throat> that we are studying in the book of Revelation, mainly the end times of human history, things look really bad. They look bleak before the return of Christ. And even in our own present historical circumstances, the world scene does not look so optimistic, does it? If we look at the world scene over the last year or so, you have the political and social unrest of 2020 that is flooded into 2021. It's not too different. We had the two-week coronavirus lockdown. Somebody needs to go back to kindergarten and learn what two weeks are. Um, the economic uncertainty that many individuals and families are facing. You have the social isolation and the cultural divisions that are separating peoples and family members from one another. But I want to affirm and proclaim that God has been good through it all. No matter what your experience of the last year has been, God is still good. In our own congregation, as I went through a few weeks ago, the list of tragedies that our own members have gone through and are going through. Even over the last couple weeks, I mentioned in our announcements, Michael and Brittany and their loss of sweet baby Max, who lived and got to be loved by his family for those eight hours before he went home to be with the Lord. Great tragedy. Then you have the circumstances of this last week with Jacob Hinckley and Cassie and Jacob's near fatal motorcycle accident and his broken body, yet his spirit isn't broken. And what God is going to do through all of that in their family and in the life of all those who love him and Cassie. You see, personally, over the last month, I've been preaching to myself as much as I've been preaching to you. 
And there were certain moments as I was reflecting on the last few weeks where I made these certain statements that I felt were led by the Holy Spirit and they were highly significant. Some of which were statements like this, believers are called to face all tragedies with endurance and faith. Are we not? Or this one, we are to hold fast to the testimony of Jesus. No matter what tragedy comes knocking at our door, whether it is the death of a loved one, a loss of a job, or an unexpected diagnosis, we must hold to the truth that God is good no matter what. And then last week, when talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I said God is not always here to put out our fires, but to walk with us through the fire. And so I knew in those moments that God was preparing us for something. And so over the last six months, I haven't been feeling real well. And so I got some blood work done and there were some abnormalities that came back. There's that unexpectedness, right? And so this last Monday, I had an appointment with a specialist and he seems pretty confident that I have a form of leukemia. Now, this is something that we don't fully know nor realize what this entails yet. I've got the, over this next month, a good amount of blood tests, uh, some of which we're waiting to come back, very specialized ones, CT scan, you name it. The specialist is ordering everything. And yet, it's one of those situations, man. Jen and I have been talking about it all week. We see God's hand through all of this. We see His goodness. And we know that whatever this is, and we're still hoping and praying that it's not what the doctor thinks it is. That something comes back and it doesn't confirm what he thinks is all, you know, already confirmed. And yet... I take so much hope in what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said to the king. He said, I, they said, we know God is able to deliver us from this fire. But if he does not, we will still worship him. And that is the reality, folks, of what all of us are facing. And so I share that just so God's people would partner with my family and I pray for us. Because we need it. And this is one of those things that we didn't expect. But it, God was not surprised. Amen? And so we trust Him in these moments. And I love what my wife has been saying lately. God is good even when the good looks bad. Let me say that again. God is good even when the good looks bad. And so as God's people, whom we know in our life, we will face world tragedies, we will face personal tragedies, things that we do not expect, unexpected tragedy that comes knocking on our door, how are we to handle those things when things look bad and the dragon wants to whisper in our ears that God is not good? You see... We must remember that when things are really bad, God is still really good. We remember the call to endurance and faith that Revelation gives us. We don't let the mouth of the dragon blaspheme God to us. We don't even give him an audience. We don't listen to his voice, but we listen to the voice of God. And above all, we don't follow him. We follow the Lamb. And so, today, let us not forget the structure of this wonderful book we are reading. And in this structure, as we are going to look at today, those who follow the beast and those who follow the Lamb. And we follow the Lamb wherever He may lead. The structure of this vision that John has is you have the bad guys and the good guys revealed in this vision. The first three visions are the bad guys, the unholy trinity, the dragon, 
the first beast out of the sea, which is the Antichrist, and the nations that are under his rule. And then you have the second beast, like a lamb, but speaks with the mouth of a dragon. He comes out of the land, and he serves the first beast, the Antichrist and those nations, and causes all the world to worship him. That is the unholy trinity of the end times. But then you have the good guys, which we'll see today. We get the lamb and the 144,000, or the redeemed of the earth, the church. And then you get three angels who have these three messages to the populations of the world before the great harvest of the righteous and the great harvest of the wicked at the second coming of Christ. So today we're right in that transition point between the bad guys and the good guys. The unholy trinity and the trinity of God and those who follow the Lamb. So why don't we go ahead and read it together. There's two sections to our passage. It's the mark of the beast and the number of his name. And then the second section is the number of the named or the redeemed. So why don't we stand and read Revelation 13, 11 through 14, 5. This first section you'll remember because I covered most of it last week. I'll just give a short review on the second beast, and then we'll jump into the next vision. So, Revelation 13, 11, just to give the full picture of this third vision, John writes this, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence, and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is the number of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom that the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion, here comes the good guys, stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, Like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder, the voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps and they were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and before the elders. No one can learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as first fruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. You be seated. So let's talk about this mark and the number of the beast. Now, we're going to recap this beast for a moment. Um, in verse 11 and on, it read that this beast rises out of the earth. He has two horns like a lamb and he speaks like a dragon. Now we're, we have three things here. The depiction of the second beast, we have his deception and we have his decree. Now in the depiction, two horns like a lamb, we already know, shows that it's inferior in power to the first beast who has 10 horns. Horns symbolize power. The first beast has 10. The second beast has two. Okay, he's not as powerful as the first. He actually serves the first beast or the Antichrist. He speaks with the mouth of a dragon, showing us his connection and his allegiance to Satan, who we know to be the dragon who is really ruling and reigning over the fallen kingdoms of the world in the end times. Now, this second beast exercises authority 
And it's the authority of the Antichrist in his presence. And here's the big thing we need to know about this false prophet or the second beast. It says that he makes all the earth to worship the first beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. This is the counterfeit resurrection. It's not a real resurrection. It's a false one. So you have Satan trying to be like God. You have the Antichrist being trying to be like the Savior, Jesus. And you have the false prophet trying to act like the Holy Spirit. You have this counterfeit trinity, the unholy trinity, and you even have a counterfeit resurrection. But here's the deception. Just as the Holy Spirit works signs and wonders to lead people to Christ, the false prophet is allowed to work false signs to lead people into false worship in the end times. And then this decree, and it's kind of what is the most important thing to take away from the rise of the second beast, is that he will have the authority to issue a decree. After making the image of the beast and getting people to worship that image, the decree is that anyone who does not worship the image of the beast will be slain. They will be martyred. They will be killed for their faith in Jesus and their refusal to comply with the governmental authorities of the end times. Kind of interesting, is it not? Not all authority is bad. But there is fallen authority that has rejected Christ that uses authority to control, manipulate, and take advantage of people, even kill them. And we've seen that throughout church history, and we will see it even more so when we get closer to the second coming of Jesus. But look at what the second beast does in verse 16. It causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead. This is where you get the dun, 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 like the impending doom, right? This is the mark of the beast. Some of you are so excited that we're finally going to talk about the mark of the beast. And I'm just going to ignore it and keep moving on. No, I'm not. It's there. We need to look at it. But it is a mark on the right hand or the forehead in this vision that John has. And this mark on the right hand or the forehead means that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, the imperial seal of the Antichrist, and it is the name of the beast or the number of his name. So let's talk about this counterfeit mark for a moment. Because remember, Revelation references the Old Testament all throughout. And the Old Testament talk significantly about God's people being marked for God, having a mark on their right hand or their forehead. Do you think if the book of Revelation talks about the mark of the beast on the right hand and the forehead and God's word in the Old Testament says the same thing, should we not pay attention to that mark in the Old Testament? Absolutely we should because it's a reference point we should know, and it'll help us understand what this mark really is. But before we get to those references in the Old Testament, we have this to talk about. There is the seal of the Holy Spirit in the book of Revelation and in the New Testament church. We are told that we are given the seal of the promised Holy Spirit when we believe in Christ. The Holy Spirit seals us, marks us, we belong to God as His children. And that is only for those who have faith in Jesus Christ. They are the children of God. We are told that everyone who does not have faith in Jesus Christ is a child of the devil. Wait a minute, Pastor Phil. You mean to tell me that good people who don't believe in Jesus are children of the devil? Yes. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. We are all children of wrath and the devil until faith in Christ when we're adopted in him. Every one of us. We live as our father of lies and we lie just like him. He was a murderer from the beginning and we have murder in our hearts. And yet when we are redeemed, he has no ownership of us any longer, but we are marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. And here you have Satan once again trying to steal and mimic what God does. He's like, well, wait a minute. All God's people 
are marked on their forehead. I'm going to mark my people on the forehead. I'm going to let God know that these people are mine. And I have ownership and a title deed to their life. And so in the end times, there is this mark. Is it a literal mark? Is it symbolic? Is it spiritual? What is this mark? We don't know. We don't know what it is exactly. But we've got some indications. We do know it will be given to all people, small and great, rich, poor, free and slave. We know the location of the mark, the right hand or the forehead. And we know the type of people who will bear this mark, those who worship the beast. So a lot of people get freaked out about the mark of the beast, and they talk about all the things that could be a computer chip in the hand, you know, all kinds of crazy things, especially in our current environment. Let's just say that the mark is absolutely tied to who you follow and who you worship. Right? So you need not fear the mark if it is not something that is causing you to worship a false deity or to follow him. Okay? So that's important to look at. But what does the Old Testament say about the mark on the hand and the forehead? Exodus 13, 8. There's two examples in Exodus 13, verse 8 and verse 16. We'll read both of those because they are going to give us understanding. Exodus 13, 8. I will just read the highlight and then I'll reference the context so you know what it means. This is Moses writing to the children of Israel. God is speaking through Moses and he says, You shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall be to you as a sign, which is the same word as Mark, on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes, which is your forehead, that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. So what is the context of this passage? If you go back and read the verses before, what is the sign or mark on the hand or the forehead? It is the feast of unleavened bread. It is a religious feast and practice symbolizing the Israelites being taken out of slavery into the promised land through the feast of unleavened bread. That on that night of Passover, they had no leaven in the home and they ate unleavened bread in haste because they had to flee from the wrath of God and be saved. So the mark or the memorial is not a physical, literal mark on the hand or forehead, but it is the practice of worship that has marked them as those who belong to God. Number one, the mark is the way in which one practices their worship to God. Secondly, Exodus 13, 16, it shall be as a mark on your hand or frontlets between your eyes for by a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. What's the context of this mark? It is the act of redeeming the firstborn sons of the human family, or the livestock with the sacrifice of a lamb. So they were called every firstborn son. That father had to sacrifice a lamb for that firstborn son. And that will be a mark on your hand and between your eyes. What is the act of redeeming your children through the sacrifice of a lamb? Do you see the significance? That the mark on the hand and on the forehead has to do with those who have been redeemed by the sacrificial lamb, which is Jesus. So what is the mark on the forehead and on the hand of those who follow Jesus? Those who practice their faith and worship him, keeping the commandments, and those who have been redeemed by the sacrifice of Christ, who is the lamb. That is the spiritual mark that the people of God bear in the end times. So what about the mark of the beast? It is those who do not worship the lamb, who do not follow him and have not believed in his sacrifice on the cross for them. They bear the spiritual mark of Satan's ownership over their life. 
Verse 17, those, if you do not have the mark of the beast, no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. And what is that mark? It is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, how could this be that there will be a historical time period in the end times where if you don't have some sort of mark, whether it's a literal mark or a spiritual mark, where you are not allowed to buy or sell in the world's marketplace? Two years ago, that might have been a little far-fetched. Nowadays, is it really that difficult to believe? Because we have, and here's my disclaimer, anything I mention in this illustration right now, I do not believe is the mark of the beast. But it illustrates a point that the government can mandate things, and if you don't comply, you're not allowed to do certain things. So we have a scenario, let's take the masks for instance, and I don't really care how you feel about the masks. You could love them, you could hate them, you could care less. Either way, it doesn't matter. But the example is, we've all been required to wear masks, that you can't buy anything in a store if you don't comply with their wishes for you to wear a mask. You can't buy and then certain companies are not allowed to sell or do business if they are not wearing masks in the exchange of goods. So is it far-fetched to believe such a thing? Or to say that you have those who are vaccinated and those who aren't. And if you are vaccinated, you can do these things. But if you aren't, you can't do these things. We live in a time where it's very clear that there's an overreach of governmental powers that are seeking to control the masses and get us to comply what they think is best for us. How easy will it be when the Antichrist comes to power, when all the world seems to be in favor of him, except for the church, for him to mandate things, even the practice of worshiping him, where all the world is going to go in that direction and everybody who does not is the problem. It is highly conceivable in our current historical context. And so whatever that mark is, the act of worshiping the false deity, the Antichrist, and denying Christ, a literal mark on the hand or the forehead, whatever it may be, it is very easy to see how humanity could slip into that type of restriction. Look at 18. This calls for wisdom. God wants the people during the time of John's writing of this book to have wisdom and to understand what the number of the beast is and who the beast is. Everybody's like, well, what's the number of the beast? Or what's the mark? Or who's the Antichrist? During John's day, God expected the people to know who John was referring to. It wasn't a great mystery. But to us, separated by almost 2,000 years, we're like, hmm, I wonder who it was. Or what's it going to be like? It's like, no, no. They knew who it was during this day. The number is 666, and we're told it's a number of a man. So the first beast is a coalition of nations, but it's also the leader of that nation. And during the time of this book, the Roman Empire was ruling over the nations of the earth. And it had an extremely wicked leader a few decades before who many believe John's vision is referring to. Now, I found a really fascinating article by a Harvard professor about the magic of numbers. Right? I don't believe everything coming from Harvard. But this is a, a, an interesting take on it. And he's not a believer. But he writes about the numerical significance of the book of Revelation, specifically the number of the beast. And he says, over the centuries, people have looked for the dreaded number and found it everywhere, from the Pope to pop culture, from Roman numerals to Viagra. That's right. Viagra has a molecular weight of 666. It does. Several years ago, devout moviegoers in Georgia were spooked when their tickets for Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ had serial numbers that, we, that began with three sixes. You could see three sixes everywhere. Sometimes the triply repeated digit six is all it takes to trigger a vision of the beast. 
Here's some more examples. As in the six letters in each of the three parts of the late President Reagan's full name. Ronald Wilson Reagan. Six letters in each name. I'm not saying Reagan was the Antichrist, but you can make it say whatever you want it to. Not only that, the triple W's of the World Wide Web. Right? If W represents the sixth Hebrew letter valued at six. Going back to chemistry, some have even seen the beast not in Viagra, but in life itself based on the carbon atom with six protons, six neutrons, and six electrons. Now these are various examples of how you can make the number of beasts be anything. But in fact, we probably know the wisdom of Revelation and who John was referring to. It is Roman, and it has to do with numerals, but they aren't Roman. You see, the Roman involved in this is the Emperor Nero. The numerals are letters of the Hebrew alphabet. If you take Nero Caesar... In Hebrew is Neron Kesar, and when you add up the letters, because each Hebrew letter has a numerical value, when you add up those letters from Neron Kesar, you get 666. It is literally the wisdom and the calculation that God's word was expect, expecting God's people to understand. And why would, they, why would John write that? Because if he plainly wrote, Nero is the Antichrist and so is the evil Roman Empire, they would be killed as enemy combatants. But because it was a calculation, there's deniable plausibility. It, it's the Pope. It's this or that. Could, they could claim it's a number of things. But you know, it's fascinating. Some of your Bibles have a notation that says it's not 666, but some ancient manuscripts have 616. Do you see that in your Bible? So which is it? 666 or 616? It's both. What do you mean? Neron Kesar in Hebrew, Nero Caesar, that N at, at the end of the word Nero, Neron, is optional. And if you omit the N, which is worth 50 points in the Hebrew alphabet, instead of 666, you get 616. 666 minus 50. So the only plausible explanation of a person whose name in both circumstances equals the number of the beast was Caesar Nero. So what does that tell us? There was a past fulfillment in the emperor of Rome and the Roman Empire. But there will be a future fulfillment where the empire that rules over the face of the earth in the end times will be like Rome in its wickedness, and the Antichrist of the end times will be a wicked ruler like Nero. And that is where the number and mark of the beast comes from. But what about the number of the named? Here's the good guys. Look at it. John says, then I looked and behold, on Mount Zion stood the lamb. And I hear this soundtrack in my head, you know, like the great movies of war, the brave hearts and all those things where suddenly here is the hero, heroic force that is against all evil on the earth of that day. And it is the lamb. What an intimidating picture. Bah, little lamb. <laughs> You're like, oh, really scared, right? No, no, this is the lamb who was slain. You can't kill this guy. He comes back from the dead. And he's got 144,000. Now, in military days, that was a huge army. But we're already told who these 144,000 are. The first indication is they had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. The name of the lamb and the name of his father. Clearly, the lamb is Jesus. Can we agree on that? People disagree on who the 144,000 are. Some end times views say this is Jews in the end times after the church has already been raptured out, which we haven't necessarily seen in scripture yet. And these are the literal, not one more than 144,000. And if we hold that view, they have to be only men and only virgins because that's how it's described next. But we're told that these are those who have been redeemed from the earth. And we'll get into that a little more. The 144,000, I'll try to make it real simple. It is 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. But not every tribe is mentioned. There's one tribe omitted from Revelation 7 that we're told, and it's the tribe of Gad. Why is Gad, omit, Gad omitted? 
because they had a long tradition for many generations of false idolatry and worship. They were not pure in their worship of God, so they were omitted from this example because the people being symbolized by 12,000 from each tribe is a people that are symbolized by men. Well, there's two offices or positions that women weren't allowed to hold in Israel. Warriors and priests. So this means that the people of God who are symbolized by the 144,000 men and women are being symbolized by those who are warriors and priests to God. And we're told in the Old Testament that all of us, men and women, are priests to God Almighty. So ready to fight the dragon and his forces and ready to worship God through the midst of those tragedies. But then we're told that we're marked by his name, the name of the lamb and the name of the father. And we're told that they are those who are redeemed from the earth. Listen to what it says. And I heard a voice from heaven. So there's a lamb and this huge military force because they wanted warriors who weren't worried about women. That's why they were being described as virgins that their sole focus was to defend and serve their king. And that's how the church will be in the end times. Look at this. He heard a voice. It was the sound of one voice, but it's actually many. Listen, it was a voice from heaven, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. So the lamb and the 144,000 as a picture of the heavenly realm. And the roar of many waters is this one voice coming out of heaven The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps and they were singing singular voice. They referring to many were singing a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and for the elders. So we're back into the heavenly throne room where it is the lamb who was slain, who opened the scrolls, the one who allowed the trumpets of God to be blown. The one who now is in this vision with his people singing a new song. What does that mean, a new song? There's a new reason to sing. And I hope today you leave with a new reason to sing and praise the Lord because something has happened at this point in human history. People have been redeemed by God for all eternity. They were welcomed into the holy presence of God because Christ has since paid for their sins on the cross and opened heaven for all those who believe in him and that sound of worship and this new song was coming from the people before the throne and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth why are the 144,000 not a literal 144,000 from Israel because we are told that Israel was redeemed from Egypt and the church of the Old and New Testament were redeemed from the earth. Exodus 6, 6. Therefore say to the people of Israel, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you from slavery to them and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgment. Israel's redemption was from Egypt, from slavery to the promised land, which was to embody and picture the people of God in the Old Testament and the new who are redeemed from the earth in the end times. Where do I get that? Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us. Writing to Gentiles, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Who did Jesus become a curse for? Every people, tribe, and nation. Those are the people who are redeemed from the earth. The church themselves embodied by this number. Verse 4, it is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. I find there is a limit to some people's willingness to follow the Lamb. Sometimes we are willing to follow Jesus only so far and only at a certain cost. But when 
the cost of following Jesus exceeds our expectations of what we thought he would require of us, we start to back out. We start to think, no, 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 that's too much for God to ask of me. That's not fair. That's not what I signed up for. That's not what I want. Any of the tragedies I've mentioned over the last few weeks is nothing of what anybody in our congregation has wanted. And each of those circumstances have far exceeded what those individuals thought God would require of them. And yet I can tell you with great pride in my heart as their pastor, none of them has backed down. Every single one is still following Jesus and it is hard for them right now. But they have not backed down in the face of tragedy. They have not listened to the dragon's lies and stopped believing in God's goodness. But even when good looks bad, they know God is still good. So are you willing to follow the lamb? Because we are markedly different than those who bear the mark of this world. We are different than those who put their hope in this world and the leadership of this world. We are those who put our hope in the world to come and the life to come and the leader of heaven and earth. He has marked you on your forehead and on your hand so that the works of your hands glorify him. So the thoughts of your mind are pleasing to him. So that no matter what you and I are faced with, whatever tragedy knocks on your door, that you don't crumple under the weight of it, but you fall at the feet of Jesus and you ask him to carry you when you can't walk anymore. There is no greater hope in my heart right now than for you to understand this closing point that you are marked by God for his purposes. And sometimes his purposes are not pleasant but they are glorious. They are not good because we like them. They are good because they glorify God. And may we glorify God in life and death and follow him without restriction and with that out with absolute abandonment to him and his good purposes. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your preparation. Lord, for your sovereignty, for the glorious hope we have in Jesus and the honor of following you through the fire and through the flames to be delivered by you and to enjoy the glorious hope you have given us through faith in Jesus. And I pray that any person hearing this message today would not be of this world, but they would be adopted and transferred into the kingdom of Christ through faith in Him. May we be marked by You. May our worship and our word be pleasing to You. And may You be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.